Hello and welcome to this webinar on passive diffusive samplers. I am Debbie Dietrich, the corporate industrial hygienist for SKC, and I am pleased to present this training event. This webinar is designed for health and safety professionals of all levels. I will first present some basic scientific concepts, followed by frequently asked questions, including those asked by longtime users. Finally, we will look at advancements through the years in science and technology of passive samplers and the samplers available commercially at this time. Now, I anticipate that this webinar will be a little longer than our usual, somewhere uh, less than an hour, so this would be a good time to refill your coffee cup. So let's begin our discussion with the definition of passive sampling that can be found in scientific reference books. Passive sampling is the collection of airborne gases and vapors at a rate controlled by diffusion through a static air layer without the movement of air through an air sampling pump. The principle of operation can be defined in very basic terms. Chemicals will diffuse from an area of higher concentration in the workplace or other test area to an area of lower concentration on the sampler itself. And the rate at which individual chemicals diffuse can be scientifically determined by the manufacturer of the sampler. You know, I always like to think of, of the, use the example of room deodorizer. When you spray it in the hallway, you will eventually smell it in the adjacent rooms because it diffuses from an area of higher concentration where you sprayed it to an area of lower concentration where you did not. In more scientific terms, diffusive sampling involves the movement of contaminant molecules across a concentration gradient which can be defined by the famous fix first law of diffusion. So let's look at each of the parameters starting with, oh, sorry, sorry, let me go back. Fix first law of diffusion is the most important principle in passive sampling. And the formula is shown here. Q the amount of contaminant collected is equal to D, the diffusion coefficient, multiplied by A over L, the sampler geometry, multiplied by C, the airborne concentration, and T, the sampling time. Okay? And now we will look at each of these parameters. D, the diffusion coefficient. This is a chemical property, like the molecular weight. It is unique to each compound and is available in reference books. A is the cross-sectional area of the diffusion path. In simplistic terms, this means how big is the face of the sampler? How big is the sampling area based on the geometry of the sampler? L is the diffusive path length. This is the distance from the diffusive barrier, the front of the, of the sampler, to the collection media. Okay, simply again, it's the distance from where the chemical enters the device to the collection media itself, whether it's sorbent or a chemically impregnated uh, paper tape. So if you send SKC an email asking for a sampling rate for a chemical not in our guide, what our chemists do is calculate 
D times A over L for your specific compound and the passive sampler that you're using. We look up the D in a book. And of course, we know the geometry, the A over L of our specific samplers. Now, if you are new to passive sampling, it is important to note that each chemical being sampled has its own unique sampling or what we sometimes call the uptake rate. Same thing, sampling or uptake rate. These values are provided to users by the manufacturer, SKC. The sampling rates are based, again, on the geometry of the sampler, A over L, and the unique properties of the chemical, as we just discussed. That's it. Fick's first law allows for the mathematical calculation of the sampling rate. Again, D times A over L. The SKC research chemist had advised me that if you have the proper sorbent and you know somewhat ideal sampling conditions, these mathematically generated sampling or uptake rates using fixed law are fairly reliable. But if the sorbent is not suitable or not the best sorbent for the contaminant of interest, or the environmental conditions are less than ideal, these theoretical sampling rates may not prove reliable in the field. Alternatively, passive samplers that have undergone studies to experimentally verify the sampling rate and other critical parameters will provide a higher degree of reliability, which you need when you're doing compliance sampling or other critical projects. So the take home message is simply this, be informed, be an informed user. When you use, when you use a sampling rate supplied with your device, know how the sampling rate was determined was it experimentally verified under various environmental conditions? Or was it simply a mathematical calculation of D times A over L? Ask the supplier, ask SKC, if there is a validation report or a government agency method to support the data for your target compound. This will help you to determine the reliability of the results and the suitable applications. SKC has a list of chemicals in our catalog and on our website for which we offer passive samplers. This list includes the sampling or uptake rates along with the amount of scientists scientific testing that has been done to verify the sampling rates and other parameters. See the passive sampling guide on the SKC website or in our printed catalogs. And this will give you details on the validations done by SKC or methods produced by government agencies. Okay, so that's the basic science. Let's now move on to some frequently asked questions about passive sampling. First, does the type of sorbent determine the sampling rate? In a word, no. As we just discussed, the sampling rate is determined by the diffusion coefficient of the contaminant, D, and the geometry of the passive sampler, A over L. The type of sorbent does not determine the sampling rate. The sorbent, however, may affect sampling performance, including reverse diffusion. If you have the wrong sorbent, 
chemicals may diffuse on and then diffuse off because they're not adequately retained. That's why validation and testing is very important. Next, are the sampling rates the same when sampling inside and outside? Okay, this has a, a few little um, complications here. When sampling on a person who is moving around, or when you're sampling in an indoor environment with some, you know, some reasonable air movement. Yes, the sampling rates would be the same inside and out. What we worry about is low face velocity. This would be a concern when doing area sampling in an indoor environment with nobody, not on a person, nobody's moving around, you're doing area sampling. Maybe the HVAC system is turned off and there's essentially no air movement. With no air movement, you shut down the diffusive process. An SKC test indicates with no air movement in the test area, sampling rates may decline up to 60%, 60%. Another common question is how to determine the sampling rate of a mixture such as petroleum distillates. With mixtures, the sampling rates are estimated by one of two ways. First, we can assign an average sampling rate based on the chemicals in the solvent mixture. Or you can look at the SDS yourself, select a marker compound, if you will, that is in high concentration and use the sampling rate for this single compound. Either way, the results are an estimate of exposures, but can provide some screening levels for you. Okay, so I hope now you have an understanding of the basic concepts and the frequently asked questions. And now we're going to move on to advancements in science and technology through the years. You may be surprised, like I was, to learn that passive sampler technology actually that emerged starting in the 70s and 80s was actually based on some very early technology. Here's a fun fact to know and tell if you're a science nerd. As early as 1927, two scientists patented a passive monitor for carbon monoxide. They passed them through these so-called palladium chloride salts and looked for a color change. Uh, the next uh, advancement that I could find was in the 1960s where there was a personal dis dosimeter for hydrazine, again, using a colorimetric principle. But it was 1973. That was the big pivotal year for passive samplers. In 1973, Palms and Gunnison developed the first quantitative device based on the principle of diffusion. Now, what's really um, an amazing coincidence is 1973 was the exact same year that SKC made the first charcoal tube for NIOSH. And I think back that I'll tell my age that I was in ninth grade at that time, and I little did I know that my future career was being set during that, that big year of 1973. 1977 saw the first charcoal badge for organic vapors, and by 1980, both 3M and DuPont introduced organic vapor monitors. 
the concept of a passive sampler represented a revolution in exposure measurements. That time people were using those old loud big pumps, the um, MSA Model G. So goodbye old loud heavy pumps, hello simplicity and convenience. The passive samplers for organic vapors developed in the 1980s were a major breakthrough. But the science and technology of passive samplers continued to advance through the years, like the disco music of that time. Beginning in the late 1980s, there were scientific advancements in passive samplers that it just seemed to me in many ways mirrored the advancements in sorbent tubes through the years. You know, just like with sorbent tubes, the first passive samplers were available only with activated charcoal. Over time, however, passive samplers were developed with a choice of sorbent materials for organic vapors. SKC began to offer samplers with scientific validation to document performance, just like the NIOSH methods for active sampling. Next came specialty sorbents, chemically coated sorbents, and coated filter paper to collect a range of both organic and inorganic compounds. And like with sorbent tubes, we now see passive samplers using thermal desorption for sub-PPB level determinations. And just like with active samplers, in 1986, NIOSH published a validation protocol to test and verify the accuracy of passive samplers. This protocol specified the testing of factors that we also study in active methods, including analytical recovery, storage stability, accuracy and precision, and so forth. But there's also included in this NIOSH protocol some factors unique to passive samplers, like reverse diffusion, chemicals diffuse onto the badge, but then they diffuse off due to improper sorbent selection. The NIOSH protocol also specifies tests to study the effects and interactions of various environmental parameters, face velocity, relative humidity, and so forth, along with performance in the field. Very comprehensive testing, just like with tubes. Here's one page I just wanted to show you. I realize you're not going to read all of this page, but just, just glancing at it, you can see that NIOSH spells out very, very detailed tests of every critical parameter for passive samplers. Now, the founder of SKC was a physical chemist. And he was very, very impressed when NIOSH published this validation protocol. This test procedure by NIOSH was an answer to concerns by many that passive samplers were being used in the field with no validation of accuracy and precision. So in the early 1990s, SKC research chemists embarked on a program to validate the performance of SKC 575 series samplers for organic vapors based on the NIOSH protocol. And this SKC passive sampler validation program continues today in many, many facets. SKC's commitment to sampling reliability is demonstrated in our extensive line of passive samplers with various levels of testing, 
All of our test data is readily available to our customers on our website. And that data includes things like comprehensive research reports. We list the critical parameters like the uptake rates, the recommended sampling time in our sampling guides. And this gives you assurance of sampling reliability and it gives you documentation if you ever have to stand before OSHA or stand before a judge and jury and defend your data. Now beginning in the 1990s, there were also some important initiatives from government agencies on passive samplers. The US OSHA Tech Center took some very important steps in not only advancing the science of passive sampling, but also in advancing the use of passive sampling for compliance. Their efforts focused on how to determine the overall error of these devices. You know, of course, everybody loves the convenience of passive samplers. He just doesn't like to hang a badge and that you're done for the day. But health and safety professionals need to know if these devices are generating reliable data for your unique target compound. OSHA initiatives help to answer these questions. OSHA advanced the science of passive sampling by developing validated sampling and analytical methods for a list of compounds. If you look on the slide, as of, 19, as of 2017, there are OSHA methods for all the compounds shown on this slide using passive and active samplers. You can view them on the OSHA website by going to the index of methods on this link, and I, I, will, uh, be, I will send this PowerPoint if you want to just look at the links for anyone who asks. Another option is to simply go to www.osha.gov and simply search using the chemical name. You'll get a lot of information on the chemical and if you scroll down, OSHA will give you the sampling method. Very, very good website that OSHA has. Next, let's take a look at the passive samplers specified in the OSHA validated methods. OSHA methods for organic vapors specify the use of a passive sampler with a carbon-based sorbent. The SKC VOC check or 575 series samplers are listed as an option in these methods. Here you can see the first page of the OSHA method for benzene you can see that OSHA lists the SKC 575-002 passive sampler or the 3M 3520 as sampler options. As an aside, note that this, these new methods in the 1000 series from OSHA also include the option of active sampling. They put active and passive sampling together now in their newer updated methods. The SKC 575-002 sampler contains anazorb 747, which is a carbon-based sorbent. It is very versatile. This is a beautiful sorbent that allows for the collection of both polar and, and many non-polar uh, compounds. So OSHA loves this sorbent and they specify this particular badge in their methods. 
Anisorb 747, however, is more expensive than plain old coconut shell activated charcoal. So the, the SKC 575-001 samplers are specified in the SKC internal validations where appropriate, as this is a more cost-saving option for users. It's just up to you to decide if you want to use the 001 or the 002 when both would be suitable. Note also that the, the 3M3520 passive samplers have both a primary and a secondary layer of sorbent. They modeled this like after a charcoal tube, right? The SKC575 series samplers do not have two sorbent layers. Instead, they have more sorbent in a single layer. More than the, even that you combine the front and the back of the 3520, we still have more sorbent in a single layer. The reason the single layer is a better option, it reduces the cost of analysis. The lab only has to analyze one layer. Now also note that the secondary layer in a passive sampler doesn't function like a backup layer, an indication of sample breakthrough like it does in a, in a sorbent tube. The reason is there's no pump pulling the vapors to the backup layer. It's just, it just provides more capacity. So why not put it in one layer and have a cheaper analysis? Similar to chemically coated sorbents in tubes, we are starting to see passive samplers that use chemically coated sorbents for unique compounds. OSHA method 1014 for styrene is one example. The sorbent is anisorb 747, chemically coated with terp-butyl catechol. We, this is the SKC 575-006. This badge is ready for use. SKC chemically coats the sorbent, and all you have to do is put the sampler in the test area as usual. It's ready to go. Some OSHA methods specify passive samplers containing specialty sorbents for unique target compounds. The inorganic mercury badge has been around as long as I've been at SKC, more than 30 years. And it is specified in OSHA method ID 140. This sorbent has been sold under various trade names. The most, probably the most well-known is, uh, is uh, Hopgolite. The names have changed throughout the years just for commercial reasons as we try and source the sorbent. But the material is the same. Oxides of manganese and copper. And then this sorbent is analyzed by cold vapor atomic absorption. Very long-standing method. The SKC Mercury Passive Sampler is packaged as a two-part system. Single-use sorbent capsules and reusable capsule holders. The method is suitable not only for eight-hour time-weighted average sampling, but for extended sampling up to 120 hours. All of this validation is written up in the method as well as a separate backup report on the OSHA website. OSHA has also validated passive samplers for formaldehyde. Formaldehyde passive samplers use paper tape media chemically coated with DNPH dinitrophenyl hydrazine. 
The SKC UMEX 100 is listed in OSHA method 1007 for this application. OSHA makes a key technical point in method 1007, can be disturbing to some users. They state that no passive sampler should be used when the source of formaldehyde is formalin. And there's a lot of sampling that goes on for formaldehyde in this situation. Well, OSHA's, OSHA's statements have nothing to do with the samplers themselves. They have to do with the chemistry. For, formalin is formaldehyde in methanol. Well, formaldehyde and, and methanol will react to form other compounds, and the diffusive sampling rates of these other compounds are different than formaldehyde itself when, it, when they vaporize. They don't vaporize this formaldehyde. So the sampling rates are different. OSHA states in the method that sorbent tubes with a calibrated airflow should be used to sample formaldehyde from formalin solutions. Also note that freezer storage is required for formaldehyde samplers using DNPH chemistry. Elevated temps will cause the DNPH to decompose, which may cause sampler background levels or your results to be erroneously elevated. To avoid these temperature concerns, it is also recommended that you expedite shipment of the samplers to the lab after sampling. A 2010 OSHA method specifies a passive sampler for hydrogen cyanide. This device uses soda lime sorbent, like in the same as in the active method. But since the sorbent tends to clump together in the passive sampler, the sampler is provided empty and the sorbent comes to you in a vial to meet the method requirements. The sorbent can then be transferred from the vial to the sampler by the user when sampling begins and this will overcome the clumping concerns. OSHA also advanced the science of passive sampling for short-term sampling. You know, those of us that have been in industrial hygiene for many years, we think that, yeah, passive samplers are only used for eight-hour TWA sampling. But some of the new methods from OSHA specify minimum sample times of only 10 minutes. And this includes the benzene method. So this allows for use of passive samplers in evaluating short-term exposure limits. Some brand new US EPA initiatives will also advance the use and application of passive samplers. In 2015, EPA released a new regulation that requires fence line monitoring of benzene at petroleum refineries using diffusive thermal desorption tubes for sample periods of 14 days. Now, it was surprising to me, actually, to see passive samplers specified in this regulation. You know, stainless steel canisters have been the sampler of choice for environmental sampling of VOCs. But canisters are not typically used for sample times longer than 24 hours. Since the new EPA regulation specifies sample times of 14 days, passive thermal desorption tubes are specified. 
Note that EPA method 325 does not specify a passive sampling badge like we use in industrial hygiene for VOCs. For this EPA regulation, the passive sampler is a stainless steel tube packed with specialty sorbents such as Carbopac X or Anazorb GCB1. These tubes are placed inside of a shelter, and SKC also makes the shelter, and they are deployed for sample times of 14 days at locations outlined in the method. After sampling, the passive tubes are placed directly into a thermal desorber for GC or GCMS analysis. Here you can see one of the tubes. We offer these tubes for this method. They are sealed with swage lock caps. They have a unique ID number and a barcode as required. Like with active thermal desorption tubes, passive thermal desorption tubes are reusable. Once the sorbent is hit with heat to analyze it, it is clean and ready for reuse. Of course, at some point, the sorbent breaks down and there is, it is no longer usable. Your laboratory is the best judge of the sorbent condition. Here you can see the tube-style passive samplers in the two configurations, first sealed with the swage locks, for storage, and then with a diffusion cap in place for sampling. Now note, you have to have a small wrench to remove the swage locks. So be sure you have a, a, a small wrench in your, in your sampling gear. A common question that I've gotten on these is whether you can take a thermal desorption tube designed for active sampling and use it for passive sampling. The answer is no. The position of the sorbent bed is critical in the passive tube because it determines the uptake rate. The passive tubes have the sorbent bed in a precise location, and it is not the same as with active tubes. Passive tubes, of course, can be used for a lot more VOCs than just benzene. Here's a partial list of sampling rates for other VOCs using these devices, and this list is on the SKC website. Now, on this slide, I wanted to clarify the use and application of the SKC Ultra Passive Sampler compared to the new passive tubes. The Ultra is a badge style passive sampler that has been available from SKC for several years as an alternative to canisters for PPB level determinations of VOCs. With this device, the sorbent must be transferred to a thermal desorption tube for analysis. Each of these samplers has unique applications for use. As a badge style device with a larger surf sampling area, the face is obviously larger than the little hole on a tube, the Ultra has a higher sampling rate of 16 milliliters per minute for PPB level sampling of benzene from 8 to 24 hours. The tube style passive sampler, on the other hand, has a smaller sampling area and thus a lower sampling rate of 0 0.67 milliliters a minute, less than a milliliter a minute, for sampling up to 14 days. And the reason for this when you sample for an extended period, 14 days continuous sampling, you need the sampling rate to be very low 
so you don't overload your analytical system. Across the pond, the UK Health and Safety Executive has also been busy with passive sampler initiatives. In June of 2016, they released MDHS Method 104, which comprises three subparts for sampling of VOCs. Here you can see each of those three subparts. One of these, if you look at method two, is diffusive sampling using thermal desorption tubes, like I just discussed in the EPA method, the exact same thing. Now, when I looked at these three subparts, I thought, well, heck, where's regular old uh, passive sampling with solvent extraction like we do in industrial hygiene every day? But there is a separate method. Method 88 has been available from the UK Health and Safety Executive for some years. That is your standard organic vapor badge that we use in industrial hygiene with solvent extraction. SKC research chemists are also busy doing validations of passive samplers. On this slide, you can see the list of just the newest validations done using SKC 575 series VOC check samplers. You know, many of these validations are done at the request of users. The methanol passive sampler, for example, was developed because health and safety professionals and laboratories came to us and, and said, we need a passive sampler for methanol for the fracking industry. Methanol is frequently used as an additive in fracking fluids, and the existing active methods are just burdensome to users, primarily because of the very short sample times. The sampler for anesthetic waste gases that, that SKC Chemist validated provides a simple option for health and safety people in the hospital industry that are sampling in recovery or operating rooms. SKC chemists have also done validations of the UMEX series of passive samplers. If you're unfamiliar with the UMEX series, the sampling media is chemically treated paper tape as, as, as a collection media. Each of the three models that you can see with the different colors on the slide have a unique chemistry that provides a simple and reliable sampling option for the list of compounds you can see. Now, if you've never used them before, let me just give you a quick, quick lesson on how they work. You slide the green, yellow, or pink cover down, and that exposes the holes. The contaminant diffuses through the holes onto the chemically treated paper tape, when you're done sampling, you slide the, the colored uh, cover back up to stop sampling and send it to the lab. When it gets to the lab, they will remove the paper tape, extract it according to the method, and analyze. Very easy, very uh, handy. If we look at first at the green UMEX, this is UMEX 100. Uh, this has been validated for formaldehyde by US OSHA in method 1007. SKC chemists have validated the UMEX 100 for other aldehydes shown on this slide. And all of these rates are on our website. The yellow UMEX 200 has been validated by SKC chemists for nitrogen dioxide. This passive sampler is sensitive enough to measure nitrogen dioxide in the occupational setting down even to the current TLV, which was lowered to 0.2 ppm 
as a TWA. In the environmental field, nitrogen dioxide is a frequent pollutant evaluated in near road monitoring, you know, looking at traffic pollutants. The UMEX 200 can be used for this application as well with 24 hour sampling. The yellow uh, UMEX 200 has also been validated for sulfur dioxide. This passive sampler can be used in occupational setting to measure the NIOSH and OSHA TWAs. It cannot, however, be used for the TLV for SO2 because the TLV is issued as a STEL. And this sampler cannot, does not have the sensitivity to uh, measure the STEL level of SO2. And like with uh, nitrogen dioxide, the UMEX 200 can be used for low-level environmental sampling. In this case, we're talking 24-hour sample times. The pink UMEX 300 is for ammonia and can be used for TWA or STEL sampling in the occupational area. And it can also be used for 24-hour sampling of ammonia in the environmental arena. You now, you, for those of you not involved in environmental, you may be surprised, but there is actually an ammonia monitoring network in our country. I think they're looking at ammonia levels from, you know, livestock uh, situations. SKC's commitment to research and passive sampling continues. At the time of this webinar recording, SKC chemists are actively working on a new sampler design. We call it the multi-check, and it has three separate compartments to contain the sorbent. So, if you put the same sorbent in all three compartments, you have a sampler with a very high uptake rate for low-level detection like that needed in indoor air studies or, or short-term industrial hygiene sampling. If you put different sorbents in each of the three compartments, you can collect multiple compounds that require different collection media all in one device. So look for details forthcoming from SKC on this in the coming months. SKC does not manufacture direct reading passive samplers, but we do offer passive color tubes from Draeger or GasTech. With these tubes, the length of a color band indicates concentration in air, like with other tubes. Shown also on this slide are colorimetric badges sold by Morphix Technologies. SKC does not sell these badges, but to cover this subject in a comprehensive way, I wanted to bring them to your attention for training purposes. With these badges, the intensity of a color change correlates to concentration in air, which can be determined from color comparison charts or other means. We take a closer look at the passive color tubes, how they work, Instead of breaking open two ends like you do with regular detector tubes, with the passive tubes, you break open one end. You clip it in the holder, and then, and you have typical sampling times of one to eight hours. Chemicals will diffuse in, produce a color change, and the length of stain is indicated in ppm dash hours. You divide by the number of hours sampled to determine ppm in air. These tubes are available for, I think, a significant number of target compounds, and they're really handy. They are, for example, you have a, you, uh, the carbon monoxide tube. 
is an easy way to do screening of forklift emissions. You don't really, maybe you don't want to buy a gas detector, have to buy calibration gas. You just want something quick and easy to get some idea what your levels are. And this is a nice, inexpensive, easy way to do it. On, with amorphix technologies, again, they contain a chemically coated filter paper called an indicator layer. Target chemicals react with the chemical coating, producing a color change. And Morphous Technologies is really the leader in these kind of color badges. The sources of air with these direct reading colorimetric devices are similar to what you would have with standard color detector tubes. You know, the accuracy is more limited. It's not a laboratory method. You have interfering compounds that can cause similar color reactions. You know, and they can be affected by environmental conditions. Maybe the sunlight might cause a color, change, a color to fade. But anyways, they, they play a valuable tool like any direct reading instrument. Thank you very much for your attention. As I promised, we were getting close to an hour. As you can see, there's a lot of science and technology behind passive samplers. So as you consider your sampling options, consider new passive samplers, the new applications, the new methods, the new validations. If you have any questions, you can always email skctech at skcinc.com or contact your local representative.